One of the things that you say in your book uh, is that leadership has actually changed in the digital world. What's the biggest change in the nature of leadership and what stayed the same? Well, I think the, the, uh, the overwhelming amount of information available to literally everyone uh, all, all the time and on the move means that all of a leader's uh, actions are highly scrutinized in real time. That's part of it. And that can, of course, affect the way a leader thinks about the decisions he or she has to make. But there's also an interesting dynamic where we used to debate issues. Um, you know, whether an issue is right or wrong, now that tends to be more about narratives because a narrative can be introduced into social media and then echo as people pass it from individual to individual in real time. And we think, we just think that makes a leader's job harder and more important. So, Ori, the, the, the title of your book is Radical Inclusion. Inclusion occurs throughout the its entire book. It's about inclusion. Apply your lessons uh, to the present day world. Take it to Washington. There doesn't feel like a lot of inclusion going on in a lot of places in Washington right now. How, what could leaders in Washington learn from your book about how to lead in Washington? It sure doesn't feel that way. Uh, so I teach at a business school and I would say that we don't really have any business cases about military leadership. And what surprised me as a Berkeley guy was just how much the military depends upon creating a sense of belonging and how important that is. And whether it's at a corporation or on a national level, we need to create a sense of belonging. We've been thinking about inclusion as kind of a punishment that people have to go to, like detention. But instead, inclusion is a way for us to more effectively get information and to more effectively de disseminate the information throughout the organization. Ori, how important is for everyone to participate? And when you see these student activists on the streets, how do you apply the book on them? We absolutely need to realize that we, we need an instinct to listen amplify and include. One of the most inspiring things I've seen in the last couple of weeks are the students from Florida and how they're demanding a voice and they're saying something very important and it's up to us to be able to amplify that, especially in this age of the digital echo. General, this administration has been criticized for being the presidency of one and I won't ask you to pass judgment on the administration, but on the context of your book, can one person or for that matter one country uh, take leadership here, especially when you have to deal with Russia, North Korea, Iran and so many other fronts? Well, you correctly point out that the the number uh, and complexity of the security challenges we face. By the way, hearkening back to roughly 2014 is where this all began to coalesce. You know, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and the lingering threat of terrorism. No one country can possibly um, have the resources, the the. The, the, the knowledge that, that they would need to deal with every one of those by themselves, which is why we have this exquisite system of allies and partners that's been in existence since the 50s. And we need to double down on those allies and partners in order to first and foremost understand the challenges we face. Secondly, to uh, share the burden so that the solutions we find are affordable and therefore will endure over time. General, one of the great challenges when one writes or talks about leadership is it becomes very abstract. And your book tries to really address that by having concrete examples, either from your experience or from other leaders' experiences in the real world. Let's take a real world example right now. I was talking just yesterday with Ambassador K. Bale Hutchinson to the NATO about the situation with respect to Russia and the poisoning of the former Russian spy on British soil. Right. Without regard to where you're leading to, everyone agrees we need U.S. leadership right now in this area. How would you apply your rules of leadership to what the United States should be doing right now? Again, without regard to exactly what needs to happen, but how do they lead? Well, first of all, you know, a, a challenge, a security challenge like Russia shouldn't just become about the United States and Russia. It can't. Uh, because our, our NATO allies have huge stakes in the behavior of Russia on their eastern borders and, and now, as you see, inside of their borders. And, and as they meddled with election, uh, that becomes uh, even a, a threat to uh, you know, the very basis of democracy, which is really all about trust in the process. So I think the, the answer is somewhat self-evident. This ought to be about the NATO and the European Union, and of course we're part of the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization 
Administration, coming to some agreement about the, the depth and breadth of the behavior, and then collaboratively uh, finding a way to have all of our policies, co uh, you know, complement each other, so that we're we're providing a unified front against that threat. Okay, Ori, um, one of the things that you talk about in your book is the fact that when you define a community, you could define a team, you're also defining who's not on the team, who's not participating in it. Coming back to the United States again, one of the basic themes of President Trump has been America first. How w should he go about determining who should be on the team, who should be part of the community, and who should be, by definition, outside of it? I don't think that America first is going to be an effective winning strategy. One of the stories that we look at in the book is uh, this company called Impossible Burger. So you think whoever would want to try a veggie burger. And yet what Impossible Burger did is realized that in order to best market their burger, they offer it in very high-end steakhouses where it can be really well prepared. A couple of days ago in New York, I got Marty Dempsey to try one. Uh, he never <laughs> thought he ever would. Not to tell <laughs> Well, now we told a little bit. But the fact that they're able to get uh, the former head of the military to try it is an effective winning strategy. And we need to ask ourselves whether our national strategy has that level of inclusion. Because without it, by trying to exercise control, we're not going to be ultimately effective.